your generation, the young people, should not have to worry. You should be the first generation that does not fear Alzheimer's. And to do that, you simply need to get on active prevention. When you turn 40, or if someone's already older than 40, get a cog- what we call a cognoscopy. With the increasing global burden of Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases, can you provide kind of a state of play where we are now in terms of what are the current global efforts to combat these diseases? How optimistic are you that we're going to find some solutions relatively quickly? And where might we expect the next big breakthrough to come from? Yeah, so I am very optimistic. Um, And in fact, I would go so far as to say, Alzheimer's is now optional and and becoming, at least becoming optional very quickly. And here's what I mean by this. For my generation, and I'm I'm just turning 71, so I'm an old guy, but for my generation, this has been the biggest concern that people have had. Uh, If you ask, you know, what are you concerned about? People say getting Alzheimer's, losing my mind. And we're talking about something that dwarfs COVID. So in, in the United States, over 1 million people were killed by COVID. Uh, Of the currently living Americans, about 45 million of us will die of Alzheimer's. So it really dwarfs the COVID pandemic. It's just, of course, that it's slower. Uh, So on the other hand, what we showed with our recent trial, and this is freely available online, you can look this up on Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, 84% of our people actually got better, which was unheard of before, that we're actually taking people who have cognitive decline and actually making them better. So my argument is your generation, the young people, should not have to worry. You should be the first generation that does not fear Alzheimer's. And to do that, you simply need to get on active prevention. When you turn 40, or if someone's already older than 40, get a cog- what we call a cognoscopy. Just like we all know, when you turn 50, you're supposed to get a colonoscopy. Everybody knows that. But when you turn 40, or if you're already over 40, please get a cognoscopy, get evaluated. You can actually see what are your risk factors, your genetic risk factors, your biochemical risk factors. Now, as you pointed out, where are things going? It's really interesting. This is a very exciting time because things are changing rapidly. There is the classic approach, which is we're gonna get a single drug and it's gonna cure the disease. Now that worked really well with simple infectious illnesses worked great with pneumococcal pneumonia and things like that, all sorts of infectious diseases, and even into HIV, where you have to have three different drugs to get a really good impact, or at least two in some cases. Uh, But it was always about get a drug, it targets the problem. We've moved into a new era, 21st century disease, and this has been one of the problems with classical medicine. And I came through classical medicine, trained classically, but it became clear over time that the way I was trained is not the optimal way to approach complex chronic illnesses. And that's what virtually all of us are dying from now. So we're talking about neurodegenerative illnesses. We're talking about cancers. We're talking about cardiovascular illnesses. And then we're talking about these chronic infections that are that often go undiagnosed things like Lyme disease now long covid things like this these are fundamentally different from what we were di- dying from 100 years ago and therefore you have to approach them differently and this is where precision medicine comes in for cancer and this is what we're we're looking at for alzheimer's so what you have is you have one group, and actually it's billions and billions of dollars that are going into the production and the the development of the the antibodies against amyloid. This was a great idea in the 1990s. It's unfortunately out of date now, and you can see it from the results. Uh, And so so whereas some people are continuing to argue, oh, this is a breakthrough, this is huge, These things don't make you better. And that's, of course, the goal here is to make people better. What they do is instead of declining more rapidly, you decline slightly less rapidly. And, you know, one of the husbands of one of the patients with Alzheimer's said to me, you know, these drugs that slow the decline, 
when you have when you're living with someone who has significant alzheimer's that's the last thing you want this person is is you know is living in a horrible situation and do you really want to prolong that so that's been the problem you know the my argument is if you have spacex with elon musk and he tells you every time we send up uh, one of our spaceships it explodes and kills everybody, but we've got a major breakthrough. It now explodes 27% later. Is that really a breakthrough? So what we'd like to do is have it so that it doesn't explode, so that the astronauts survive. And so you've got this whole group of people that's focused and being paid well to focus on that, unfortunately, as, as was written, uh, all of the op-eds that were written in support of these drugs were written by people who were paid by the drug companies that make the drugs. Now, wait a minute, you know, that, that that's a problem. What about, you know, what about the best outcomes? So we want to focus on best outcomes. So that's a whole area of the field. And that is where the classic people are. You know, that is the mainstream medicine. If you go to any university center today, that's what they'll focus on. On the other hand, people like Dr. Lee Hood, who is the, you know, he's the the role model for so many of us, just a brilliant, brilliant guy, won the the Medal of Science from President Obama. He's the one that invented the DNA sequencer, as well as the peptide sequencer and the peptide synthesizer, just a brilliant guy and, and a bioengineer. As he points out, and he's published recently a book with, with uh, his protege, uh, Nathan Price, uh, that is called the age of scientific wellness. And as he points out, we need to focus on the whole system here. Systems biology his, is his approach. And so uh, our, you know, what, what my laboratory group and I came to was a very much the same conclusion. After 30 years in the lab of studying what is actually driving the neurodegenerative process, what we found is that it is a network insufficiency. So when you get a degenerative disease, what that is saying to you is you have a network, whether it's the neuroplasticity network that is critical for Alzheimer's, whether it's uh, motor modulation that's critical for Parkinson's, whether it's motor power that's critical for ALS, whether it's macular support critical for macular degeneration, they all share in common that that particular sub-network within the nervous system is being overdriven and or undersupported. So there is a mismatch. Normally, you know, you're doing great, but over time, if you have too little support and too much demand, then you ultimately drive this into a state of decline. It's not terribly surprising. So when you go after that, you can't just say there's one thing. You've got to look at the network. You have to characterize it. And when we characterize the network that is required to keep your brain in its beautiful neuroplasticity, we've been able to show that, okay, it really boils down to two major groups of things. Too much of the innate immune system activation. In other words, ongoing inflammation. And it's especially, as Dr. Alexei Karakin, who's an interactomics expert, pointed out, it's especially the memory component of the innate immune system. And then it's too little energetic support. And by that, I mean blood flow, oxygenation, mitochondrial function, and ketones. Some, you got to have something to burn. And so if, when you now look at those, okay, everybody who has cognitive decline has a mismatch there. And it can be genetic because of the ApoE4, for example. It can be because you're exposed to inflammagens. And by the way, unfortunately, COVID-19 is one of them. So, you know, get set for more people with Alzheimer's. That's already been published by epidemiologists. If you had COVID, you're at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it, it can be because you have a leaky gut. It can be because of changes in your oral microbiome. And all these things now for the first time fit with what the neuropathologists have been telling us for years, with what the epidemiologists have been telling us for years. So now we actually understand what Alzheimer's is. As you know, it's been claimed to be dozens of things. It's misfolded proteins, it's prions, it's amyloid, it's tau, it's uh, you know uh, type three diabetes, it's herpes simplex of the brain, all these things, none of them has ever led to a successful treatment. 
And so when we, on the other hand, look for each person, ah, what are your drivers? Then you actually address those things. And it's different for each person, no surprise. And we often find chronic infections. We often find chronic exposure to various toxins, be they inorganics like air pollution, organics like glyphosate or biotoxins uh, like uh, you know, trichothecenes and other mycotoxins, whatever they are, these things are critical. And we, of course, we find people with sleep apnea. People have known for years, sleep apnea increases your risk. Why? Now we understand why. So you have to fix and address these things. And when you do, now we've had the best outcomes in history. So very excited about that. And so the, really these two kind of polarized groups, my hope is that just like the PGA and Live Golf that nobody thought would come together and they've come together all of a sudden, that the pharmaceutical targeting will come together with the precision medicine protocols because the two will help each other. It makes no sense to try these drugs as monotherapeutics. You're addressing something that's far too complicated. It's kind of like saying, you know, what's the one paragraph that I can write that will be good for all chat GPT answers? No, it doesn't work that way. And that's the same thing with Alzheimer's.